Now it's time to talk about the impossible Selenelian eclipse, which is where this series was always headed. Of course, it's no secret that Selenelian eclipses are geometrically impossible. A quick Google search will bring up all kinds of sources, including NASA, talking about some upcoming impossible Selenelian. And this is what that Space.com article says. But wait, how is this possible? When we have a lunar eclipse, the Sun, Earth, and Moon are in a geometrically straight line in space with Earth in the middle. So if the Sun is above the horizon, the Moon must be below the horizon and completely out of sight, or vice versa. And indeed, during a lunar eclipse, the Sun and Moon are exactly 180 degrees apart in the sky. So in a perfect alignment like this, a syzygy, such an observation would seem impossible. But it is atmospheric refraction that makes a Selenelian possible. Atmospheric refraction causes astronomical objects to appear higher in the sky than they are in reality. Ah, the obligatory appeal to refraction once again. This rescue device saves the ball Earth from terrestrial observations of objects that are geometrically hidden behind hundreds or even thousands of feet of curve, and from celestial observations that are, admittedly, also geometrically impossible. And it is that geometrically impossible part that we must remember, because it drives home the point that without the completely unsubstantiated claim that refraction can project the sun, moon, mountains, cities, lasers, and other objects that are geometrically hidden behind the curvature of the Earth up and around the Earth so that we can see them, the entire heliocentric model is observationally falsified a million times over. But the refraction rescue device is why I did this series the way I did, starting with new moons and solar eclipses. Because whatever degree refraction can lift a full moon up and around the horizon, it can lift a new moon, right? Let me try to make this illustration at least a little closer to Heliocentric's version of reality. So this is my not-to-scale version of the Sun, Earth, and Eclipsed Peak New Moon in what that NASA article called a geometrically straight line in space, exactly 180 degrees apart in the sky, and a perfect syzygy alignment. And their explanation for Selenelians is that Atmospheric refraction causes astronomical objects to appear higher in the sky than they are in reality. The idea is that although this sun, earth, and moon are in a geometrically straight line in space, we see the sun and moon in their higher refracted positions. But if that were true, then the same would apply for this solar eclipsing peak new moon, where the sun, earth, and moon are also in a geometrically straight line in space. So if Middle Earth guy over here can see the eclipsed peak full moon straight above his head, while Terminator guy can see the refracted versions of the sun and that same eclipsed moon on his horizon, then Middle Earth guy over here can see the eclipsed sun at high noon while Terminator guy 6,000 miles away can see the refracted version of that same eclipsed sun on his horizon. But our resident globe proponents have assured us that it would be a minimum of 54 minutes after peak new before Terminator guy could see the eclipsed sunset. And based on the actual solar eclipse observations I've shown in previous videos, it seems to be closer to a two hour time difference in many cases. There is still so much more to say on this subject, but while we let this part sink in and anticipate the but 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 explanations from the ball earthers, let me finish with some footage from Ron Hagberg that many of you have already seen. Ron shot this footage from Chipley, Florida on January 31st, 2018. On that day in Chipley, the moon set at 634 and the sun rose at 634. So both sun and eclipsed moon were on or at the very least at the horizon at the same time. So here's Ron on the Terminator line in Chipley, Florida, and here's his sun Earth and eclipsed moon in a geometrically straight line in space, 180 degrees apart in the sky, in a perfect syzygy alignment. And Ron is able to experience both sun and eclipsed moon on his horizon because he's actually seeing them in their refracted positions, right? So I guess we can just forget about that 54 minute minimum that the globe earth mathematicians told us about, even though their minimum was supposed to be including dip angle and refraction. But did you notice that Ron's moon wasn't fully eclipsed, 
it was in the process of eclipsing, from the top down no less, at the time it set in Chipley. So let's add in the Earth's umbra, which is said to be 2.6 moon diameters wide at the point the moon crosses it, and see how that works in this view. As it turns out, Ron's moon set at 634 in Chipley, 52 minutes before peak full moon, which wasn't until 726 a.m. Ron's time. So the reason Ron's moon was only in the process of becoming eclipsed when it set is that the actual position of the moon at that time wasn't here, but here. And it's going to take one heck of a lot of dip angle and refraction for Ron to see the moon set from his terminator line when it's still an hour on the other side of peak full. But what if there is a way to eliminate their baseless dip angle and refraction rescue devices? I'll take those on in my next video. Thanks for watching. And thank you Ron Hagberg for this globe crushing footage that you shot.